Floodcast. Floodcast. Get in the arena. All right, morning, Bill. Morning, Jason. So with that said, uh, well, we're here, Bill. Well, I'm here, man. Uh, pretty excited you um, accepted my request for an interview yeah, on your yeah. new book called Smith's Heart of Man Repair Manual. Smith's Heart of Man Repair Manual. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. So I've got some questions here. Please. Uh, I, I want to ask you, and then Thank uh, you. we can get talking about a few different things. That'd be great. Okay. <clears throat> Bill, what is the origin of the book? And I know when I read Chapter Zero that... Um, greetings and salutations. Greetings and salutations, chapter zero. <laughs> when I read that, it gave me the overview of where the original question popped in your mind. And then it, it kind of goes through as you try to answer the question, you realize it's going to take you're, more. You're going to have to unpack some things. Right, you're going to have to unpack some things. Yeah. So I guess at what point, how far after that um, kind of aha moment that you had of uh, asking that question to yourself, the question was, what the hell happened to all the men in society? Okay. What happened to men in society? What the hell happened? What the hell happened yeah. to them? And as you unpack that and everything, like, wouldn't you have the aha moment that it was going to be more, or you knew it was going to be more than just a simple answer? That's a really good question. So uh, I, I like to think I'm spiritually minded. So whenever something like that, like, I feel like God's speaking to me. I don't think God's necessarily speaking to me so that I can give him an answer. I think God's speaking to me because there's something that he wants me to kind of pick up on. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Uh, you know, meaning like, you know, if God is omnipotent and all-knowing and omnipresent, he already knows everything. So it's not a question for me to answer him. It's a question for me to answer. And that particular day, and I'm going to give you some historical context, Jeremy and I, we were at Target and he was looking for a coffee machine. Mm -hmm. At that time, Target was kind of, and I didn't put this in the book because I didn't want to get sued, but I can say this now because the format we're doing this. Uh, Target was having a lot of Issues in the national forefront for their uh, genderless restrooms, uh, meaning that if you identify as a man, yet you are biologically a woman, but you identify as a man, you can go into the uh, men's bathroom, vice versa. And, and that really caused a lot of red flags. And that was the first time in that kind of a context where in our nation that somebody or I'm sorry, some organization really stepped up and said, we are doing this. So and, as you guys are on your way to Target. No, we're in target. Right. You're in target. That pops in your mind because you're. I know you're. You're versed. You're. You're constantly um, researching what's going on. Not in the the um, major news networks or anything, but all over the place. You're. You're right. You know what's going on. So you already knew this was happening mm -hmm. at Target, obviously, and and it kind of popped in your head while you're there. Yeah, it was. Uh, but you know, like I describe in greetings and citation, like I thought, like a just a real quick topical. Well, well, that's you know, we're in target. You know. As I started to probe and kind of pray, I kind of started to realize that symptomatically our culture has begun to neuter, devalue, dumb down the idea of the traditional male role model or the patriarchy. And this, this I'm just going to say this real quick. This isn't a chauvinistic thing. This isn't, uh, you know, I'm a woman hater or anything like that. It, it's not that at all. And one of the quotes I put in my book is that, not every leader is a man, but every man is a leader. And I believe that men have acquiesced, handed over, forfeited, whatever you want to say, our responsibilities as heads of the home, uh, heads in our community. And that's not to say that women can't be. I'm not, once again, this is not uh, chauvinistic. I, that's not my intention. That's not my heart. But right. I began to just notice a lot of different things in pop culture, movies, books, things like that, that really started to paint a picture that when you isolate them, that might just be, well, that's silly. But when you collectively begin to look at it, it started to paint this picture for me that, yeah, this there's something going on here and it needs to be examined. I don't really know if anyone has. So that kind of was, that led me down that rabbit hole, if you will. Fair enough. So with that explanation, what is this book and what isn't this book? Okay. What this book is, honestly, I really believe there's principles that all people, regardless of gender, can equate and use into their life. 
Now, why do you say regardless of gender? Because to me, there's a lot of, we talk about quality, we talk about character. There's a lot of things such as uh, accountability, benevolence, humility, manners. There's a lot of things in this book that aren't necessarily defined by gender. You know, everybody needs to learn how to be a little more humble. Everyone needs to learn about okay, accountability. Okay. So, what is the name of your book again? Smith's Heart of Man Repair Manual. And there's a duality even in that. So heart of man, meaning like you and I are men. So the primary audience are, is men. Okay. But it doesn't mean that if a woman were pick it up, I believe that she would be able to get a lot of out of that too. Okay. So what isn't this book? This book isn't to say that one sex is better than the other. This book is not to be misogynistic. This book is not to be chauvinistic. This book is not to necessarily dehumanize, to point fingers, to discount anyone. This book, in many ways, is um, my story. It, it's my testimony. I uh, like to highlight a lot of my flaws, a lot of my inadequacies and life lessons and parlay them into this. So this isn't anything other than a, I would hope it's something to remind men, to remind culture. But more importantly, I hope it's something to provoke thought and that people would actually take this to heart, think about it, ponder what's being said and just say, is this dude cracked or Maybe there's some information here. Maybe he's pointing something out that I can actually use and apply in my life to make my family better, to make myself better, to make my community, make my world better. Okay. So what would a reader care about this book? Or why would a reader care about this book? Or, you know, what problem are they trying to solve if they pick this book up? Well, the problem they're trying to solve is something that each individual person has to kind of come to their own. And if you read the verbiage in the book, it talks about we together collectively as men, but as we individually read this, that we are not only collectively going on a quest, but we are individually going on a quest to reclaim the essence of manliness, to reclaim what a man's purpose. You know, there's a difference biologically between a man and then there's a difference spiritually, mentally between what even a man is. You know, there's the idea of a male, biological male, and then spiritually, mentally, emotionally, what a man is. In the first chapter, I take a lot of care and time into trying to shell that out. And I would hope my most lofty goal, other than uh, <laughs> being a New York Times bestselling book, would be that someone would take this and that their heart would be penetrated. And remove my name off the book, but if the information that is being shared really provokes thought, and more than provoking thought, it compels people to change for the better, to make an eternal impact in their life, I can't think of anything more rewarding. Okay, excellent. Um, so one of the things I'm taking away from what I just heard you say and, and, and from what I've read, and, and when I said I'm taking away, I guess... I don't know that you actually say it this way, but um, one of the notes I have here is there's a reason that God made man and woman. Yes. And this book focuses on the man. I would word it this way, and this is what I write in the book. When the high tide comes in, all ships rise. Let me break that down a little bit in regards to the book. In order to make any change in the world, you got to first make a change in your heart, then in your house, then in your backyard. You know, it, it all begins in approximation to where you're at. When I say the high tide makes all ships rise, when men collectively begin to take ownership of their mistakes, when they begin to realize they neglected the honor of being a man, that women can begin to understand the privilege and the honor of being a woman. Because frankly, women are better than men. I mean, that, and that's just a fact. They can put up with more pain. They're way more tolerant. They're way more beautiful. Uh, and I mean that typically inside and out. But what I mean is, is that you're right. When high tide comes in, all ships rise. So when men become the man they were created to be, when, when men and culture begin to become who they are as a culture and, and function and serve in that way, all ships to rise. So women can become who they are. And this isn't like one of these 1950s chauvinistic, you know, keep women barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. That's not it. Because a true man who is empowered and believes in himself can empower the people around him, uh, their children, their uh, wives, girlfriends, so on and so forth. And then they can become who they were meant to be. And once again, this isn't a point fingers. This isn't a divisional thing. And I see how a lot of people in mainstream media make it to be that. It, it, that's not the intention. And if you take that from it, I'm sorry, I, I believe that you're missing the, the point of the book. The point of the book is, is that as a community of men, we have dropped the ball. One thing I write, men are important, but unaware. 
we've allowed a stupor to befall us or to bewitch us. And I just really want us to, you know, kind of like Rip Van Winkle, you know, shake off that the slumber, you know, wipe the dust out of our eyes and, uh, you know, begin to become men again, begin to become who we were created and intended to be so that everyone else can begin to function and, and be who they were made and created to be as well. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so I think that really helps understand the problem. So what are, what are some things they'll take away? Are there a couple specific things they'll take away? And you don't got to give me the whole thing. I'm not looking, sure. I'm just looking for a little bit of pieces here, but um, how do they become the man they were created to be? Well, there's two things, and I, I <laughs> for copyright reasons, I left it out, but there's two songs that kept echoing through my mind when I was writing this. The first song is by a gentleman named Elvis Costello. It's called Deep Dark Truthful Mirror. And the beginning line of that song says, one day you're going to have to face a deep, dark, truthful mirror, and it's going to tell you things that I love you too much to say. The other song is by a gentleman named Derek Webb, and he has a song called Nobody Loves Me. And in that, there's a verse where he says, the truth is never sexy. That's why she's a hard sell. So put those, I, I get them, put those in your words for me. So what that means is that I let my flaws uh, out in this. Yeah, there's, I mean, you have a weekly podcast called Flawed Cast. You have a website called Flawed Inc. Yeah. I noticed that's a part, big part of your life. Yeah. And, you know, I my uh, co-host in that, who's really the, the wind beneath my wings, you know, we, we understand and we talk all the time about being flawed. And there's, you know, there's no pointing fingers. Once again, high tide makes all ships rise. You know, if I'm pointing the finger at anybody... You got to know I have three pointing back at me. I mentioned a lot of my mistakes. I mentioned the fact that I'm divorced. I mentioned the fact that there's things I have dropped the ball at, but I also mentioned that there's lessons in history. There's lessons in the Bible. There's lessons from my life that I really like to try to give to people to say, listen, I'm not above you. If anything, I'm, you know, I'm probably below you. I, I'm not any smarter than anyone else. And if I can figure this stuff out, everyone else can. I just feel like maybe this was my assignment for this moment in, in history. So for me, it's like... Well, you're talking about those two songs. Yes. And the lines in those songs. And I didn't mean to get off track with the flawed thing, but you were talking about uh, one day... You're going to have to face a deep, dark, truthful mirror. Right. You know, one of the things, and I didn't write this in my book, but I'll share this, is that when the night, the night my ex left me, I, I was pulverized. I was mm -hmm. devastated. But I remember <laughs> literally and figuratively picking myself up off the floor, and I was getting ready to not go to sleep but go to bed. And I looked at myself in the mirror, and it, it was at that moment, that song, that Elvis Costello song, Deep Dark Truthful Mirror, popped into my head, and, it, and I said to myself, no matter what happens from this point moving forward, You've got to be honest with yourself and do the best that you can. What I've gone through in, in the last couple of years of my life, just in the last four years of my life, I had kidney transplant, gone through a divorce, um, you know, just a lot of stuff. And I talk about all that in the book. But for me, the fact that sometimes we just need, a, you know, we just need a good talking to sometimes. I know I do. I know that I have people in my life that I allow to speak into me. And I'm not saying that I'm worthy of that for any gentleman that's going to read this or any person that's going to read this. But what I'm saying is, is that I would hope that this would be something that that I have gone through and I've experienced and that I'm able to give to other people. You know, one of the examples in the book is I say, you know, I feel like uh, one of these in like in the 40s and 50s, there were all these great uh, science fiction and horror films that were made. And I feel like to some degree, one of these, you know, mad scientists that made this, that had this surgery or that uh, developed this elixir. And, you know, they're like, I'm going to try this on myself. And then, you know, they try to on themselves and they fail horribly. You know, right. uh, I, I feel like to a certain degree, like I've done that. I've tested it. I've gone through this. So I understand that in many regards, what I'm talking about is, is substantial. And there is a lot of truth to it. Okay. That's a great answer to that. I appreciate that, William. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so I know the book hasn't been released yet, but there are stories in the book. Yes. This question isn't in context of the book. It's more in context of you. Uh, what story that you happen to have in the book do people ask you about that ended up in the book? Like, what's one of those stories? So there's about five people I've shared this with. And the one constant, I, you and I even discussed this before. Uh, I believe it's, it's in chapter two where it talks about quality. And, you know, I grew up in high school when they still taught kids some kind of life skill. Right. And I took four years of metal shop, wood shop, mechanical drawing. And in wood, uh, excuse me, metal shop, there were a lot of projects that we had to do, but there was an annual project you have to do where you would have to make a, um, a mold 
of some object, heat up liquid or liquefy metal, and then pour that liquid metal into the mold and create whatever. And the process that I describe in the book, everyone has commented to me on like, wow, because in the process, and I don't want to give too much away, but it's interesting that the process that you have to go through that as I was writing this, I remember, and it was like the worst project. And you had to do it twice a year because you had to have a friend help you. <laughs> and you had to get suited up. Your friend got suited up. You know, everything it was like, you know, you took your friend away from their project and that happened twice a year. So, you know, a give and take. But uh, in the book, I describe the process. But the interesting thing is that what you realize is as you're preparing for this process and you're watching metal liquefy and as you experience this, what you come to realize is that there are a lot of parallels or a lot of allegories you can ascertain by watching the process of metal liquefying and all that it takes and all that entails in order to get the the purest form of metal that you possibly can so that it can be then used in whatever manner in that regards poured into a mold but if we look at it as a metaphor for life there is a, a crucible and there is a process that men have to go through that boils us down and purifies us at the core of our being the who and what the almighty intended us to be and that is apart from, you know, all the quote unquote accolades or all the praises that people may want to laud on us. You know what I mean? But I don't want to give too much away because I actually would like for one or two people to buy the book. <laughs> that That is the ultimate goal. But that's all in there. And I think guys, and especially guys that have read it, will be able to pick out and see what that is and what that process resembles. Even if you don't have any work experience with like a metal shop or wood shop or um, metallurgy or anything like that. Certain restaurants and bars we won't go to because I, I always say there's too many cock swingers in there, which are the guys who go in and, you know, they're, they, they're tough guys. Got to right. be a tough guy, right? They, they're peacocking. Typically, they typically drive oversized vehicles or something crazy. Yeah. Um, they're <laughs> always got to be tough, always got to be mean or angry. Um, they think that's, for some reason, they think that that's impressive to people and women, I suppose. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. And, and that there's a lack of the art of being just the opposite of that. Like, it's okay um, not to be a tough guy. It's okay if a guy bumps into you that you don't have to go outside and brawl with him. It's the Wild West. Yeah, I call it peacocking. And, and this is one thing I, I talk about a lot. You know, your sexual conquests, your financial victories, your degrees, awards, and accolades do not comprise of what you are as a man. Those are the results of hard work and labor, which is I do have a chapter about uh, labor and the fruits of our or, uh, hard work and the fruits of our labor, because I think that's another thing that's gone by the wayside. You know, like we want to depend on, you know, the government. We shouldn't have to pay for college. We shouldn't have to do A, B and C. Well, you know. We should, because the Bible says, if you don't work, you don't eat, right? And that's what that chapter's about. Oftentimes, and in, in the more I've gone through this, I, I see guys like you're talking about, and to some degree, we're all like that. Sure. But when I see guys like that, you know, and they're like in our age range and you know, maybe older, uh, when they're younger, I think it's easier to excuse. But it, what it says to I me mean, is you don't have experience at that point in your life. Exactly. Which is understandable. Absolutely. Absolutely. But when you're older, when you're in your 30s, your 40s, 40s older right. than that. Well, what that says to me is this is a this is a man and this isn't a judgmental statement at all. I really don't mean it to be. This is a man that's really broken. This is a man that's really, really hurt. And in that hurt, he's put up walls. And he's fortified those walls. So no one and he, can get in. It, the very, very few people are allowed in. And that's one of the things I, I talk about in the uh, the last chapter uh, is accountability and loyalty. You know, I said most men don't show loyalty because they've never had any shown to them. Mm -hmm. And I know, like, in my life, I've been betrayed by a lot of people. And it hurts. And it sucks. Yeah, sure. I have a handful of friends that... I don't worry about that, but that's been a very careful and painful vetting process to sure. get to that point. M most guys, especially. Well, and you're you uh, knowing you for the years I have. You're the opposite. Um, you have been so open, and I don't want to say naive, uh, but you've been naive. You give sure. everyone the benefit of the doubt, no matter what, and it's taken a toll on you because, unfortunately, some people are just douchebags. Yeah. And in, in, yeah, I'm just saying, so no, I get instead it. of putting up walls, though, you have, uh, and this is something I know you and I have worked with 
on for a long time now. Yeah. Um, but it, you have uh, found ways to, you found a process, let's just say, um, to vet mm-hmm. how far. And you put up, I don't want to say boundaries, but obstacles that people have to go through. I don't even want to say obstacles. More like a quiz. And you got to pass certain quizzes to right. get to certain levels. Well, and it's not really a quiz that people have to take, but, you know, if they check off X, Y, Z box, that right. you know that, okay, these are qualities that mean that they can be this level of my friend. Right. I'll let them this far in. And the more of these yeah. qualities, more boxes they check off. Right, it's kind of like getting married. They got to check off these boxes. The more boxes they check off, the closer they can be in your in right. Your well, it's like world. the other day we were discussing a certain person, and they put on their Facebook page that you know if any guy wants to date me, he has to write like a 500 page whatever. Right. And um, and this is why this isn't just necessarily for for men only. Right. Because women carry hurts too. Right. And well, and, this could even possibly give a woman a better look at how a man's absolutely. Process and that's works. and that's what I'm hoping because. Because the psychology of a man is so different than a woman. What has happened in culture, and one of the reasons, to kind of go back to your first question, one of the reasons why I wrote this is because through culture, men have been cucked, we have been neutered, we have made our default position to be that, and this is strong language, and I, but I use this in the book, is that our, you know we've been conditioned to think that we aren't good enough, that we have to be subservient to whatever. And you know that's not right. And I don't, and that's the same thing for for a woman. If a woman's made to feel that way, that's absolutely wrong. Right. Now, with that being said, we do overcompensate in different areas where we feel weak. But the reality of it is, is, is this: in our culture, you know, in, take a look at this. Next, seriously, if you think I'm wrong, take a look at this. Watch anything on the major TV networks. Watch any major Hollywood film in the last five to ten years. Most of the men are made to be look. They're made to look like buffoons. The women are the ones that are take care and everything, and, and, and that's great. And, by, and society is a reflection of art, and we see that now. Uh, we see a lot of boys that sleep with women, and they have babies, and they go and they, don't, they can't understand or comprehend, and they neglect that, right? And I'm not throwing shade, but what I'm saying is there's a difference between being a, a daddy and being a father, Right. There's a difference between having a woman that loves you and devoted to you, but you'd rather sit there and jerk off and watch porn. Right. But both of those examples are is people refusing to understand the truth. Right. People prefer deception. They don't prefer the truth. And when I talk about like a deep, dark, truthful mirror, once again, I'm, this is stuff I struggle with myself. Sure. I get it. You know, I mean, I, I don't have any children. Like, honestly, porn's not an issue for me, but I have other stuff that I struggle with. And I'll, I'll talk a lot about it in the book. And where I think we are at as men in this society and in this culture is we have willfully taken a back seat. We have decided that we're going to just ease by. We're going to coast through life. Now, now, think about something. When you're hanging out with your friends, what's something that you often call a group of your friends? Boys, pals. I'm hanging out my boys, right? What's something you say, hey, let's go back to my crib, right? Okay. Oh, you see where I'm going with this? So it's this mentality that we have that says we can stay in a arrested state of development and not step up to the plate, not take our responsibilities. That's why, in many regards, I have so much respect for women. This book actually is a book for women so that men can pull their heads out of their ass, get their shit together, and be who they're going to be. But what ultimately what I'm talking about is being a man, stepping up to the plate, owning your stuff. Take a responsibility. I also talk about forgiveness. That's one of the chapters in there. Forgiving people, forgiving ourselves. That's for me. You want to know one of my hard things? Forgiving myself. Because I know what's in my head. I know what's in my heart. And it's often dark. Yeah. I often find myself in a very bad neighborhood and I don't know how to navigate out of it sometimes. You know, and sometimes I honestly don't want to. And all, all that's in there. All that's in the book. And I'm not saying I've arrived. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm just saying as a student of history, as a student of theology, as a student of pop culture, if I can say sociology, these are just things I've noticed. Like I said, we call our, we hang out with our boys. We go to our crib. You watch all these shows. You All this stuff. You start putting the pieces together. If you take the 10,000 foot view instead of the, you know, see the forest for the trees, if you will, you're going to start to see that there's a lot that I'm talking about that starts to add up. A lot of anomalies. All right, so let me ask you this. What is the intended audience going to care about most or be most interested in or shocked by in your book? I would think it's a combination of things. 
I, I would like to think it's a lot of the historical things I bring out. I like to think it's a lot of the scriptural things I bring out. But I would like to hope, I would hope. <laughs> when you say things, historical and scripture references. Right. Yeah, you know, at the end of each chapter, there's a quote, be it a speech, be it a quote from a movie, whatever it is. There is some nugget that, to me, in someone else's words, quantify what this chapter is about. You know, I quote Theodore Roosevelt. I quote St. Stallone. Dr. Seuss, Dr. Kent Keith, uh, Peter Niemoyer, uh, a lot of a lot of people that uh, you know, a lot of sports figures that you know quantify exactly what you know we're talking about. And for me, one of my big life things outside of the scripture is the Man in the Arena speech by Theodore Roosevelt. I just right off the bat, right in chapter one, I get into it. And we talk about it and. My hope isn't one particular thing that people would take away. My hope is that someone could read this and say, I want to do better. You know, the only difference between someone that fails versus someone that succeeds is that the person that succeeds stood back up one more time and said, I'm, I'm going to try one more time. And that's what I hope. I hope that guys are like, F it, and they can read this and be like, all right, I'm, I'm, <laughs> all right, Bill, I'm going to try this one more time. This, this is your story. This is so-and-so's story. This is what happened. I want to hope that people could be motivated out of something that they can ascribe to. You know, a lot of my issues with a lot of modern churches is that people give these sermons and platitudes, if you will, but there's no way to assimilate to what they're talking about. Well, that sounds great, preacher man, but how does that work? I really hope, I really try, this is, this is on the forefront of my mind as I write in this book, that you can understand that... <laughs> You know, this is what I did. This is, you know, these are the screw-ups that I made. And if you can identify with that, great. You know, one of the quotes I have in the book is that to learn from your own mistakes is wise. To learn from others is genius. So I'm hoping that there's a lot of people that read and say that, Bill, you effed up. So that is going to be something that's going to propel and, and hopefully, you know, uh, spark change in their life. Okay. All right, so last question. This is what we're going to wrap it up with, okay? All right. And uh, hopefully we go out with a bang here. So I want you to think through this one, all right? All right. What sentence or fact makes people sit up and take notice of this book? And I'm looking for something succinct, a succinct answer. If I had to quantify the entire book into one sentence, it, it's this, and you find it in chapter zero. Men are important yet unaware. That, to me, quantifies where we're at in society, where we're at in this moment in history. Men are vital to the preservation of not just the American culture, but all cultures. And we traditionally have been the leaders, the guideposts, if you will, for culture and moral uprightness and providing not just monetarily, but emotionally, spiritually, and even morally for the people behind us so that there's a lineage that could be passed on. Men are important, but we're unaware. We're unaware that we are important. We're unaware why we are important. We're unaware what we need to do in order to become important. And I hope that statement and the chapters in that book and the stories and the quotes and being able to take a step back and reading it, don't get butt hurt off the bat. Like I, even with this, I said some hard things. I know. Read through it. Understand it. And just say, how does, I ask the hard questions. How does this apply? butt hurt right in the book. I did. You yeah. believe you say don't get butt hurt. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> Which is awesome. So, so, um, Bill, uh, you know, obviously, thank you for your time. Smith's Heart of a Man Repair Manual yeah. uh, coming to anywhere you can get a book near you soon. Bill, Hopefully. what can you talk about uh, maybe timing of, of when this release will be for, um, because this book is going to be both uh, digital, hard copy, and audio. Audio, correct? Yeah. So, well, now that everything is copyrighted and we're all set to go, the target date is June 1st, and it should be available, like I said, on ebook, paperback, and audiobook. And it should be everywhere that you can find books. Uh, publishing, begrudgingly, I'll admit, through Amazon.com. Uh, so my goal isn't to, you know, in my loftiest dream, yeah, it'd be great to sell a bunch and have this be a turning point in my life. You know, I have a dream of helping people becoming who the Almighty created them to be, and I love to be able to, you know, speak on that. I'm already uh, working on my next book, as it were. So I'm just hoping that this will open some doors. But honestly, I just want people to get this information. I want it to take it to heart. And my mission in life is to make an eternal impact in people's lives. And I just really, really hope that this book will do it. And I hope people give me an opportunity, and they'll they'll pick up a copy and just 
look past the fact that it's me writing and, and talking and how flawed I am. And hopefully that there's some nuggets or some wisdom or some story or experience that will really connect with people. You know, my hope is, is that if my wildest dreams, like I would love to be able to have people call upon and like to speak and to help and to motivational speak, but I just want change. Seriously, I don't even need the credit. And that's the thing. Right, right. No, I understand. I want my whole goal in my, in life is I want to make an internal impact in people. And I hope that this book does that. I really genuinely do. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time today, Bill. Thank you. Again, folks, uh, keep an eye out. Smith's Heart of a Man Repair Manual. Yes. uh, Written by Bill Smith here of CLE, baby. That's right. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, just on a side note, the reason I called it a repair manual is because men don't read books. We read repair manuals. Fair enough. So... (laughs) Fair enough. There's that beloved, the loved ones. That's that's exactly it. Well, it, it's speaking the language, you right. know. And no, I get I know. it. I'm just teasing. I get it. But also, it, it should be on floodink.com too. So excellent. Well, you're probably gonna hear this on floodink.com. So I would, uh, I would hope so. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.